It was not 1942 when the machinery of genocide kicked into high gear in German-occupied Poland. The year was 1904, and the genocide of the Herero people, recognized as the first genocide of the 20th century, was about to begin. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we examine the brutal treatment of the Herero and Nama people of German Southwest Africa, or as it is known today, Namibia. The Germans are an ancient people. Their history goes back before history was recorded. They fought the Romans and Charlemagne in efforts to keep their freedom. What you may not know, however, is that as a united nation, Germany is a relatively new country, only 152 years old. For centuries, the German people lived in a variety of different principalities, duchies, kingdoms, baronies, and much of the time, those smaller entities were heavily influenced by their neighbors, particularly France and Austria. Beginning in the 18th century, however, the Kingdom of Prussia began its rise from local power to European power from 1864 to 1871, had defeated Denmark, Austria, and France in a series of wars which allowed it to be the cornerstone of a new country, Germany. The man chiefly responsible for this success was Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor, who worked primarily for two kings, Wilhelm I and his grandson, Wilhelm II, of the Hohenzollern family. Bismarck's primary goals were to unite the German people around the Prussia crown and manage international events in Europe in such a way so as to assure the security of Germany in the future, especially as it was surrounded by countries that were oftentimes hostile to it, especially France and Russia. By the 1880s, Germany had become the leading military power on the continent and was on its way to becoming the leading industrial power in Europe as well. Only one thing was missing at least to many German people. From the 1500s to the late 1700s, European kingdoms, primarily Spain, Portugal, France, and England, had established colonies around the world. For a time, the upheavals of the American and French revolutions put a break on European expansionism. But by the second part of the 1800s, the race for empire had begun again. Empires gave nations prestige and power resources and manpower, and in the 19th century, especially in the latter part of the 19th century, the growth of European empires, especially in Africa, India, and the Pacific, were believed to show the superiority of the white race as well. Unfortunately for the Germans, they were late to the competition. By the time Germany united in 1871, much of Africa, a growing part of coastal China and India had already been claimed by other countries, primarily France and England. For Bismarck, at least from 1871 to 1884, this was not an issue. He believed that colonies would do nothing except bring Germany into conflict with other European powers as well as the people who lived in the colonies themselves. What's more, he studied the issue and concluded, correctly, that in most cases, colonies which were supposed to bring wealth to the mother country often cost more than they were worth. Bismarck was a hard man, and he had near total control of what went on in Germany at least politically and diplomatically, but he found it extremely difficult to control something that he was partly responsible for, German nationalism. After unification, many Germans, both high and low, looked at the globe and saw much of it colored blue and pink, these being the colors used to represent France and Britain, respectively. The man who personified German nationalism and a desire for empire was Emperor, or Kaiser, Wilhelm II. Wilhelm came to the throne in 1888, when his father, Frederick III, died after a reign of only three months. Bismarck and others in the national government had hoped that Frederick's rule might be long, because they saw Wilhelm as a loose cannon, impulsive, arrogant, with an inferiority complex stemming from a birth defect that caused his left arm to be virtually useless. At the same time as Wilhelm was taking the throne, Bismarck began to have an attitude change about colonies. Under pressure from German business and some of his supporters, Bismarck began to see that colonies could have a beneficial economic effect if managed correctly. They would likely also be located in areas where Germany's power might offset English or French influence, and even allow him to be a power broker between these two countries, whose relations in the 1800s were not always cordial. And while Bismarck did not like the emperor personally, he also was a good Prussian who obeyed orders from higher authorities, and Wilhelm was THE higher authority. Wilhelm wanted colonies, badly, 
not necessarily for the economic gain it would bring to his country, but for the power and prestige which would belong to him as the almost absolute ruler of the country. So Germany began its path towards an overseas empire. Unfortunately for Wilhelm, most of the African and Pacific territories that were still free from European control were the poorer and more isolated ones. Over the next 10 years, Germany took control of modern-day Namibia, parts of Angola, Botswana, Tanzania, Gabon, the Central African Republic, Chad, Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, and Togo in Africa. In the Pacific, a section of Northern New Guinea, two main areas called concessions in China, many European powers at this time controlled parts of the Chinese coast, Samoa, and the Marshall Islands. It sounds like a lot, and geographically it was, but many of these places were remote, inhospitable, and limited in their resources, especially compared to the colonies of France and Britain. One great difficulty that Germany had in gaining and keeping these colonies was the lack of a powerful navy, which Wilhelm fully intended to build, despite resistance from England, whose navy was the most powerful in the world at the time. Wilhelm is famous for several reasons, especially concerning World War I, but at this time he made two speeches that would echo through the first half of the 20th century. First, Wilhelm fired Bismarck in 1890, mainly for being too cautious though that was a convenient excuse for taking control of German foreign policy himself. In 1900, millions of Chinese rose against foreign influence in their country. This was called the Boxer Rebellion. It cost the lives of many Europeans and affected many European business concerns. For the first time in the 20th century, a multinational force was put together to put down the rebellion, including troops from Japan and Germany, whose troops acted brutally. One reason for the German behavior was the Kaiser's Hun speech of July 1900, which he gave as he saw German troops off to China. If you come before the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is fortified. Just as a thousand years ago the Huns under their King Etzel made a name for themselves, so may the name Germany be affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to look cross-eyed at a German. From that point until July 1945, Germany's enemies called them the Huns. The following year, meeting resistance from Great Britain, France, and Russia in his plans to create one of the strongest navies in the world, Wilhelm declared that despite their opposition, Germany would have its place in the sun. The meaning was clear. Wilhelm meant that Germany would no longer be in the shadow of the other great European empires. One of those places in the sun, so to speak, was the land of Namibia, which came to be called German Southwest Africa until 1918. Though there were many African tribes in Namibia and the surrounding area, there were two predominant ones, the Nama and the Herero. The Nama had migrated to Namibia after having come into conflict with the Dutch Boers, who had begun to move into Nama lands in South Africa. The Nama were agricultural people, and the Herero used some of the land they settled on to graze their cattle, for they were pastoralists, semi-nomadic people who moved from place to place to feed and water their cattle. In the late 1800s, the Nama and the Herero fought frequently, and when the Germans came to Namibia in 1884, the Herero agreed to ally with them if they would help them against the Nama. In the 1890s and early 1900s, the Nama and the Germans fought a series of battles, not all of which went Germany's way. The Nama had a relatively large supply of guns and were led by able men, the most famous of which was Hendrik Witbui, a national hero in Namibia today. For a time, the Nama and the Germans came to a tenuous peace that lasted until 1904. For the Herero, the deal with the Germans was a devil's bargain. In exchange for their help with the Nama, the Germans received vast tracts of land, which they began to settle and fence off, not allowing Herero cattle on what they now saw as their land. It's important to know that the Herero valued their herds more than anything. Owning a herd brought prestige and influence, and of course their meat, milk, and blood prevented starvation and thirst in one of the hottest and arid places in the world. It's also interesting to note that most Herero and Nama were Christian, but that it did not help them when it came to German attitudes towards them. At the time, researchers, politicians, and much of the public in Western Europe, North America, and Australia were riding a scientific wave called eugenics. Simply put, eugenics involved two things, the study of heredity with the idea of creating a better human race and the categorization of people based on a flimsy racial science, which, as you can imagine, put white Europeans at the top and everyone else underneath, and the near bottom of the human pyramid, according to eugenicists, were black people, 
especially the tribal peoples of Africa. Almost as soon as they arrived, the German settlers and military began to refer to the people of Namibia and their other African colonies as baboons. Once you see a person as less than human, you treat them that way. Soon, many German soldiers and civilians were being accused of sexual assault of Herero women, and virtually all the cases brought before what passed as a court were dismissed. Naturally, this enraged the Herero, especially as one of the victims was the daughter-in-law of a chief. In response to this and many other crimes against them, including settlers and their security killing Herero and Nama people who encroached on their land, the Nama and Herero stopped fighting each other and rose against the Germans, who at first were taken by surprise by the size and ferocity of their uprising. On January 12, 1904, the rebels killed 100 German male settlers and soldiers, though they spared women, children, and missionaries, and a smaller number of non-German foreigners. The German civil authority could not control the uprising and soon called to Berlin for sizable reinforcements, led by the man whose quote began this video, General Lothar von Trotha. Interestingly enough, one of the German civil servants in Namibia who encouraged harsh measures against the tribes was Heinrich Goering, father of the future World War I ace, head of the German Air Force in World War II, and war criminal Hermann Goering. When Trotha arrived, he delivered his murderous speech and set about enforcing it. Now, with overwhelming firepower and an endless amount of supplies from Germany pouring in every day, Trotha soon drove the Herero deep into the desert, whose daytime temperatures reached over 100 degrees Fahrenheit regularly, whose nights are freezing, and whose annual rainfall is a mere 0.5 inches, perhaps the driest place on Earth. What springs and ponds there were cut off, and the Herero, whose pre-uprising population was about 85,000 people, soon began an agonizing trek into the desert. After the uprising, the landscape was covered in skeletons, and some were found at the bottom of 40-foot holes dug in the vain attempt to find water. About 15,000 Herero managed to survive, most of them moving into territories controlled by Britain, which offered them a less hostile sanctuary. 60,000 Herero died, most from hunger, starvation, and disease. But many were shot out of hand when caught. Men women and children. Much the same happened to the less numerous Nama, located mainly in the country south. With the Herero driven into the desert or killed, more German troops moved south and engaged the Nama, who fought with determination but could not find anyone to help them against the Germans, even with supplies. Both fearing a wider war with Germany, England and France refused to help, so the Nama fought until they couldn't fight no more. Thousands of Nama people were killed in battle or massacres. The survivors were sent to Shark Island, the first German concentration camp. Shark Island is a small, wind-blown island just off the coast of Namibia. The Nama were given inadequate food, poor shelter, and virtually no medical care. They were housed on the most wind-blown part of the island, where nighttime temperatures dropped to near freezing. It's estimated that 80% of the Nama who were sent to Shark Island perished. No one is exactly sure of the number of dead at Shark Island, but at one point, 10 to 18 people a day were dying. The total is easily over 5,000 and likely more. In many ways, Shark Island was a precursor to the Nazi concentration and extermination camps of World War II. They were officially called Konzentrationslager, just as in World War II, and the process of killing the Nama and Herero at the time was often called Vernichtung, or extermination. What's more, eugenicists in Germany requested skeletons and skulls of the dead at Shark Island for racial study. One of the men studying these skulls, which was only returned to Namibia from Germany in 2014, later taught one Dr. Josef Mengele, the infamous Angel of Death, who performed gruesome experiments on Jewish prisoners in Auschwitz. Because of the nature of record-keeping and census-taking at the time, no one is 100% sure how many Africans were killed by von Trotha and his troops from 1904 to 1908. However, it's estimated that anywhere between 25 to 100,000, about 80% of the pre-uprising population Herero were killed or died due to German action. About 10,000 Nama met the same fate, about 50% of the Nama who lived in Namibia. Von Trotha was given parades and medals and died in Germany in 1920. Germany officially apologized for its actions in 2004, and in 2021, agreed to a 30-year financial commitment to fund infrastructure projects in Namibia, still one of the world's poorest countries. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.